Good afternoon again, everyone. Lieutenant General Brad Webb here from Air Education Training Command. Uh, the internet is undefeated. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I, what I want to do, uh, this is really kind of the first uh, of what I hope is a series of real talks, uh, real talks on race, uh, diversity, inclusion, and really be real belonging. Uh, I'm here today with uh, two Dans, uh, Major Dan Walker from the 435th uh, Flying Training Squadron here at Randolph, and also off camera, uh, Dan Hawkins, who will uh, be serving to collect uh, kind of the comments and questions that we hope uh, to see coming in as we have uh, this dialogue. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to do, really, uh, before we get, in, get into the dialogue, is, is set the, uh, 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 the scene uh, for what's happened really in the last two months. Uh, you'll recall uh, right at the end of May uh, that a report came out to the Air Force uh, called the Protect Our Defenders. Uh, the upshot of that report was that uh, justice uh, in the Air Force system uh, was and is disparate, uh, specifically with respect to young African-American kind of first-term airmen. Uh, and uh, it's been that way a long time, and, and we are not making progress on it. That's the upshot. Uh, that obviously had the Air Force's attention, uh, but that was right on the eve of the George Floyd uh, incident. And of course, the George Floyd incident has fundamentally changed the dialogue, uh, certainly within the Air Force, but absolutely across our nation. Uh, and so, uh, so, you know, the Chief of Staff, really, he, he's kind of used the terms, uh, something broke uh, with the George Floyd incident. It, something broke uh, in our nation, something broke in our Air Force. Uh, and what we do with that break uh, is really kind of up to us. But, you know, we all kind of contend that uh, we need to take advantage of this kind of moment in time to bring about fundamental change. So the Chief of Staff uh, charge really to leadership, and what I think my charge is to our leadership, and frankly all our airmen, uh, is simply this. We need to take ownership. We need to own the situation. Uh, we need to have those tough dialogues. Uh, I think that this one will be a little bit of an uncomfortable dialogue. You and I, Dan, have both kind of said this will be uh, a tad uncomfortable, but necessary. Uh, it's not exactly a safe space. Uh, I, you know, obviously, we're hopefully reaching a whole bunch of people out here in the in inter, interwebs. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think it can serve as a good example of the type of dialogues that need to happen at all levels within our Air Force. And we need to listen. Uh, obviously, seeking to understand is a good first step. It's a good phase one. Uh, but ultimately, that listening needs to come about with action. Uh, take action that's substantive and that's real. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I have had a number of uh, small group dialogues uh, here uh, at the headquarters, uh, and you're, uh, you're listening to someone who's been in the Air Force for 40 years. I can tell you I have a number of stories that I can relate to you uh, of things that I have never heard in my life. Uh, in our Air Force, we generally tend to not talk about race. Uh, we don't talk about religion. We don't talk about politics. We probably don't talk about gender. Uh, all of these things at this point uh, are dialogues that need to occur if we're to actually have substantive breakthrough of barriers. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I, the, a story was related to me of a defender, an African-American defender, uh, that was berated uh, by uh, some outside the fence line uh, for wearing his nation's uniform. Uh, other airmen that are having to do gut checks before they put on the nation's cloth uh, to serve their nation. And uh, that, uh, to me, are jo those are jaw-dropping uh, moments. Um, so the, the Department of the Air Force has several task force that they've stood up to really get at fundamental change. Uh, you are probably aware of uh, one that's being led by the Inspector General. Uh, there's a survey out uh, to all airmen in the Air Force. Uh, to date, it has over uh, 100,000 uh, returns. Probably it's over 200,000 as of this broadcast. I, I haven't heard the latest number, but it's a lot. Uh, the Air Force leadership is hearing from its airmen. Uh, there's another task force within the air staff that's charged uh, with moving out on several lines of effort uh, and, uh, and bringing about substantive change. Uh, actually, that, this is starting to already morph uh, into the Department of Defense at large. Secretary Barrett is now the lead for diversity and inclusion uh, construct within the Department of Defense. Uh, some of those examples of uh, changes uh, uh, that we're uh, bringing about, grooming accommodations uh, based on race, uh, diacritical name tapes, uh, which of course is 
uh, uh, name na people that have last names that may be hyphenated, they may have an accent uh, on them. That heretofore, we've not allowed. Uh, we need to make accommodations for those. That's already a charge. Uh, the AFOQT and the, and the PIXM score, those are long acronyms, but the upshot is uh, our ability within Air Education Training Command uh, to uh, assess uh, the appropriateness of uh, one to serve in the rated career field as a pilot or navigator, what have you. Uh, these are 1970s style models that simply have to be updated. AETC has taken that on full force. Uh, there are a number of ROTC scholarship opportunities that are now available in what we call our HBCU or uh, historically black uh, colleges and universities and also those with a Hispanic uh, orientation as well. Uh, that we're already filling for uh, the, the coming uh, semester. And there's mandated journal officer visits, uh, kind of akin to what uh, journal officers do nowadays at, for recruiting purposes at major sporting events. We'll be doing this at historically black colleges and universities and others uh, with some in tow uh, to make uh, you know, some of the uh, underrepresented groups more aware uh, of uh, service in the United States Air Force. I think the upshot, though, uh, of this, and really my banner that I want to carry and the message that I want to leave to you, especially you leaders, is this is our moment. This is our moment. We will be judged by what we either do or don't do, uh, I think, over the course of time. And we ought to take, uh, and take a full seizure of this moment and make substantive change. So, Dan, again, uh, thanks for being here uh, today. Um, you and I have had the opportunity to have a dialogue several times. Uh, you've got some great uh, inputs and in, in part of your story. So I wonder if, if you could, if you could share with us kind of your up, upbringing, uh, where you were raised, how you were kind of interested in the Air Force and what those kind of early experiences were. Yes, sir. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for having me. And also, uh, like you said, we've had plenty of discussions leading up to this, and I've had the pleasure of seeing you exert it a considerable amount of energy on this, and I really appreciate it. And I think that's the kind of energy uh, I know I and the rest of the airmen you referred to would like to see continued exerted, continued to be exerted on this subject matter. So thank you for having me. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And I look forward to what the Air Force and the DOD produces uh, in the future. Uh, my upbringing was right here in Texas, North Texas, uh, specifically Dallas. That's where I grew up, went to high school, all the way until I attended the Air Force Academy. My experience here was fairly mixed, uh, both in terms of demographic and experience. I went to high school at Bowie, which is a very diverse place, uh, and had a number of experiences there. And in terms of my time in Texas, um, that was my first exposure to the dichotomy of being black in different spaces. So specifically, being in the band, being in baseball, playing football, depending on who you were with and what you were doing, you could have a very different experience in Texas. Um, I, for one, watched my parents uh, come of age, if you will, uh, in their early and mid-30s as I grew up and struggled with this, uh, asking them questions as a child. And then, uh, unfortunately, I had my own experiences, all the way from uh, having my life threatened. Not this is, being this able is to, in high school. Yes. Uh, not being able to play baseball in certain areas uh, for my safety. Uh, and in fact, uh, unfortunately, one of my earliest memories uh, was in, in kindergarten, and uh, one of my, my good friends... Uh, he informed me that his parents said we can't play together anymore because he is not allowed to play with black children. And so those sort of consistent experiences over time develop your lens as to what people around you think of you. Uh, teachers, uh, my parents, uh, I'm really thankful for how active they were in my life, having to go to my elementary school and defend me against uh, some white teachers who would tell me I'm not going to be anything. Uh, I'm a criminal. Uh, this is who you are. Uh, and I'm hearing this in fourth grade, third grade, second grade. Uh, and they really had to defend my self-esteem until I left home uh, to go to the Air Force Academy. So I tell you all that just to say um, the airmen you have coming in may have similar experiences. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to set their lens up for what they perceive to be what is happening to them in the Air Force and what may be real, what may be otherwise. But it wouldn't be their first time that they're – experiencing something like that. Uh, and so when some say, I know it when I see it, it's because they've seen it before. Right. Um, you know, I think uh, you shared with me uh, before uh, that, um, uh, hey, we as airmen, when we get ready to deploy overseas, uh, generally we go through culture immersion kind of courses uh, to you know, orient us on, hey, this culture is, they, be, they respond this way on that. 
Uh, and uh, we here in America uh, have uh, very disparate sections of our country. Uh, you're just describing, you know, kind of a, a, a maybe a, a scene that's uh, not too uh, unreasonable unre to see in any area in the South. Maybe very different from the Pacific Northwest or something like that. Uh, and that uh, uh, maybe leadership owes it to ourselves to kind of understand that background further. You know, any thoughts along that lines? Uh, I do. And actually, one of my first interactions with that difference uh, actually comes at the Air Force Academy where I was having uh, some pretty bad experiences specifically with my baseball team. And I went to my coach who happened to be from Massachusetts. Uh, it took a lot of energy for me to step into that office because uh, at, that, at that time, at 18, 19, you just want to blend in and, and play your sport. Uh, but I came into the office and I sat down with him and told him some of the things that I was going through and how that was difficult for me. Uh, and that was my first time sitting across from someone, pouring my emotions out about how difficult this was for me. And, and uh, as innocently as I can describe it, he just said, I, I don't see it. Uh, and I didn't anticipate that being an answer at all, really. Uh, but as I sat back and thought about that interaction, I, I, I said, well, I guess he's from a place where that just doesn't exist. And he's he thinks it still doesn't exist. Was it a racial uh, oh, yes. oriented kind of conversation that you were having with him? Oh, yes. The reason I, I came to him at that point was I didn't think I was going to be able to emotionally and physically continue playing the sport because here's this great opportunity to go you know, play against Steven Strasburg and J Jake Arrieta in front of thousands of people, and I can't. I'm having a hard time walking to the field uh, because it is that gut-wrenching to me to go and try and play a sport that's difficult while also bearing this emotional weight along with it and trying to navigate uh, how do I play along teammates that I don't think value me the same as the rest of them. So this, this is uh, stuff that's eaten at your gut from your teammates? Yes. Not from fans or, or no. something like that? From teammates. Yeah. Yes. And so to... And your coach, I don't see it. I don't see it. And so now I have to make a choice. Do I want to continue to make noise uh, and butt up against this, or do I want to play baseball? Uh, and I chose to, I chose to play baseball. Um, that's pretty heavy, obviously. Uh, uh, what about the rest of the, your academy experience? Obviously, that's an uh, athletic uh, kind of oriented uh, classroom or, I don't know, in, the, in your cadet squadron kind of thing. Right. Um, so that's where my experience back home and some of these more – uh, vivid and vitriol experiences along the way, now you have to sort of figure out where you stand between each one of those. So say someone says something off color to you, but you've had this experience in Texas and you've had these other experiences that were, that were clearly overt. Yep. Now you kind of have to judge, what is this person saying to me? Are they, just, are they just from North Dakota and they just don't know any better? Is this an opportunity for us to have a dialogue or do they hate me? Because now I don't know where they lie on the spectrum. And so I don't say that as to say that that's that person's fault, but you know, essentially at the academy, I'm a first-term airman. And now I have to manage how is he receiving me or how is she receiving me because I've gotten this poor interaction over here and now I'm exerting emotional energy trying to figure out what to do with myself that isn't an energy that, say, my white classmates have to deal with. They can be free to be themselves yeah. while I have to manage myself constantly. The, uh, when I, was, I obviously am an Air Force Academy graduate as well. Uh, when I was there... Um, there was various clubs uh, and committees that you could join. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a committee during my time frame, this is a long time ago, I acknowledge, uh, it was called Way of Life Committee. And it was a, uh, um, as far as I know, uh, oriented at African Americans to, I think probably, uh, I'm guessing, because I wasn't a member of it, but that's just kind of the point of the story, right on. Uh, to be able to share, uh, exchange shared experiences. Yes, sir. Uh, and I don't know if the Academy had something like that when you were there, uh, or what your thoughts would be really in the crux of the question. It's one thing for uh, you know, people of the same ethnicity to gather. It'd be something else if it was uh, not just white, mm -hmm. not just black, not just Hispanic or et cetera. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts along that line? Well, uh, you're talking to the president of WWLC while I was at the Air Force Academy. Okay. Uh, so it still exists. <laughs> it still exists. Uh, and it, and it, was, it, uh, was it all African American? Or yes. Was yes. Uh, while I was there, so the reason I became president of WLC is, is I was having my experiences, realized that 
uh, as I looked at my experiences back home and my experiences here and compared them against other experiences from people that were at the academy or otherwise, we needed, we needed that place first. We needed a place where we could come together and maybe commiserate <laughs> first and foremost, but think about in, a, in our own bubble, free to, to speak among ourselves with safety and say, what are we going to do about the rest of these things? Yeah. And yes, during my time there, we thought about, okay, well, well how do we take this, this time together and not just make it a, a point of time where we can talk about our shared poor experiences, but how do we branch out and make this thing uh, more influential to everyone else? Because it's not enough for us to acknowledge each other's struggles. We have to go out there and have uh, the rest of our cadets and classmates understand the struggle we're going to and, and build some bridges. And so we started out with welcoming white cadets okay. to our meetings. Uh, so one, you could sit and listen, and this is what we're thinking about on Wednesday and Friday yeah. afternoons. You know, whereas you may be somewhere else and having a different academy experience, this is where we're getting together at the end of the week and saying, did you see what happened to me? Because uh, the academy was only 5% black when I went. So that's 60 of us spread out against the cadet wing or, you know, with, of a class of 1,000. And you know how the geography is. You could be inside John or you could be in Vandenberg. So that's a place for us to get together and say, what do I do because I haven't seen one of me all week? Uh, and now here's an opportunity to take those experiences and say, okay, let's go talk to your leadership. But let's bring your leadership here and say, hey, your cadet is going through this. Uh, and, and I'm very blessed to have had even a minuscule impact in that way while I was leading that organization. Were, were you successful in having Caucasians uh, join uh, the group? Absolutely. And I, so where you have these overt traumatic experiences, I've also had very powerful positive experiences that honestly um, it keep you grounded and, and give you hope that it's possible. So whereas I had this experience uh, in high school that was very traumatic for me, I had a counterbalanced experience where someone else did something extremely positive for me. And when I was lying somewhere towards anger and, uh, and, and desperation, I used that as an anchor point to say, if it's possible for this person and, and for me to have this experience, I need to figure out how to get back here. And an example of that, for instance, uh, between the ages of maybe 17 or 19, so at the age of 17, having my life threatened, being called the N-word, all these kinds of other things, to uh, my coach at the time, Mike Koslowski, uh, sitting down with me at the Naval Academy during a baseball game and, you know, while I cried on his shoulder telling him I'm, I'm going home. And for him, uh, a northern, stocky, short, white man, to come along and say, I have no idea what you're going through, but it's going to be my personal mission to understand and help you through this place. And then he followed through. Uh, that's an experience where I can say, here's this white dude that knew nothing about anything. And he said, I don't care. I know you, and I'm going to take care of you. Uh, and if I know we can get there with him and he can, he can exist in that capacity, then others can as well. That's a, that's a start. That's an example of a start, and that's the kind of substantive action I think uh, the chief is mm -hmm. directing uh, that we take. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. That's, if I, that's, if I can say something yeah. about his action, the, the reason why it's such a model is that takes a lot of work for him to have done that. And I, I, I don't know if people appreciate how much work it's going to take for us to get to that level of empathy and interpersonal empathy between people and specifically airmen. Yeah, that point... Uh, is an absolutely key point. Uh, the amount of energy and time and effort it's going to take. Uh, again, uh, we, you know, back to you know what I was trying to say about this is our moment. That, you know, and we're going to be judged. This is something that you know uh, the temptation for all of us is going to be that COVID or hurricane season mm -hmm. or uh, a national security event or you know whatever uh, could uh, really. I mean, it's not out of the the realm of possible at all that we'll be dealing with something that says, okay, that was, uh, right. that was June, that right. was July. Right. Uh, now we got, uh, this that we have to deal with, mm -hmm. uh, and the moment slips by, uh, and the real, uh, challenge will be, um, when these other things arise that we're able to keep our eye on the ball to be able to keep our energy level, uh, at such that, uh, Hey, this was the, a moment, uh, and, not have to let that slip by. I mean, that it's easy to say, right. uh, and it's even hard for me to comprehend with all the other things that'll come. That we have got, we simply have to follow through. Yes, sir. Uh, from that standpoint. And yeah. sir, we had a question uh, come in, uh, and it's really for Major Walker. But what kept you going when you were uh, experiencing these issues at the academy, um, and made you a want to? 
keep going and pursue your commission as an officer and also you know continue to play you know intercollegiate athletics which is a, a pretty hefty time commitment as well so talk about uh, that's a great question and thank you for um, thank you for lobbing that up here um, talk about these moments that anchor you and there are a couple that stick out in my mind the first was I was a freshman um, I was just happy to be on the field and it was Jackie Robinson day and uh, the press pulls me aside, throws me in front of the camera, and is like, what does it feel like to be the only black player on the team? And I had no prep. <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, it feels like I'm the only black player on the team. Uh, and then they said, why do you think there are so few black players in baseball? <laughs> and first I'm thinking, why? I am 18. Why are you asking me about the entire sport of baseball? But then it dawned on me, uh, thinking about, Sorry. <laughs> How hard my parents worked. Baseball is an expensive sport. Yeah. And we were not well off. So for them to do that for me is why there are so few in that area, blacks that play baseball. And at that point, even my own personal privilege to say I'm here because my parents spent their last dollar to buy a $250 bat that I inevitably dinged up that they weren't going to get another one. I got to borrow it from a teammate to play this sport. And so when I think about that, I think about how privileged I am to be there, to have an opportunity to go and fly fighters and do all these other things to represent them and seeing older black people who would never think of seeing a man like me doing this, flying these jets, this technology speaking to you. I can't. I can't quit. Uh, and that kept me going for a long, 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 long time mm. um, because there wasn't going to be anybody else, statistically speaking. Right. Anything along that, else along that lines, Dan? Or? No, I, what, what's been your experience? You know, uh, you talk about the way of life uh, community, mm -hmm. uh, and they interact with, with us on social media as well. But how valuable uh, are uh, organizations such as that that keep their eye on this issue of race? Uh, that's another great question, and it's, it's incredibly important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, like I mentioned, uh, providing a space that we can get together and confer, compare notes, uh, and, and share actions and plans and mentor. Because mentorship, I, I think until we solve this problem, um, getting down and mentoring people of different cultures is going to be difficult until we have other people of the same culture around to do the mentoring. So that's, that's step one for why it's important. And then step two, to now talk to each other, now that some of us are in this position of being rafter pilots and, and generals or what have you, uh, to branch out to our cohorts and say, hey, I think this is how we, as a broader Air Force community, should handle this. So now we're, we're inside the game helping solve the problems that maybe plagued us at a, at a younger age so that we can keep the Air Force moving forward because this is, this is our Air Force too, and we care about it in that fashion. Um, I'd like to get to the, the flying, uh, your flying experience, mm -hmm. but since we're kind of on the topic of mentorship, uh, what are your thoughts uh, respective of... Um, uh, underrepresented groups being mentored uh, either by other minorities mm -hmm. or uh, by Caucasian? I mean, right. what, what are your thoughts? It has to, it has to be both. Um, but as we talked about before, mentorship is difficult and it takes, it takes effort. It can't just be, well, yeah, show up, fly the sword, you do well, and then you should do well. Uh, you got to really dig into this person. What makes them different? What are their actual struggles and challenges? And you mentioned uh, you know, our female pilots and, and the female and, and women in our service, uh, and their numbers are fairly low, too. And if, it, for instance, I have a good friend of mine who uh, was a, a civil engineering officer, and she found it very difficult to find mentorships, or excuse me, mentors in her field. Mm -hmm. And that became a really significant challenge for her, uh, and she's not in the Air Force anymore. Mm -hmm. Because the type of guidance that a black female needs isn't always something that can be provided by, say, a white male or a white female. Right. Um, and if you're playing a numbers game, and the numbers game, and the numbers are always low, you're going to run into issues of, of uh, scarcity, unfortunately. But it's important to have both. But I don't think one or the other can suffice. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I tend to agree with that statement. Um, there, uh, my personal example has uh, been a journey. Uh, on this, I mean, mentorship wasn't necessarily a, a fashion in fashion. I mean, there was there was 
mentorship, I mean, the, the concept was known. Right. It certainly wasn't formalized. Right. Uh, and so with a, that's the thing about an informal thing. It's, you're going to n- uh, naturally gravitate uh, to what's comfortable. Right. Uh, and some of this stuff is uh, uncomfortable, mm-hmm. like, like what we're kind of talking about with this today. Uh, and that takes extra exerted energy. Yes, sir. Um, how about uh, if we can just kind of move on to your flying mm-hmm. experience and whether it's uh, UPT or uh, your move into the Raptor world? Uh, yes, sir. So UPT was, I, I loved it. Uh, it was the first opportunity where I got a chance to really just dive into a task and see how good I could get. I also learned a lot. Uh, I had a, uh, some of my best friends I've made in UPT, specifically uh, D.L. Booker. Uh, he's a physics major, um, and I didn't know what a six-stage axial compressor was. And so I went to the house, poured up some, some Jack and Coke, played a little Mortal Kombat. I'm like, please explain to me how a turbine engine works so I can at least get past these academics and I can let my hands take care of business. And I got to know him and uh, uh, Curtis Voodoo Culver from the Strike Eagle, and I really leaned on those guys. Randy Chavez and, and, and a whole bunch of other uh, guys really leaned on them for my experience, right? And uh, when we had this group, <laughs> we had our monster patches on, we had our inside joint. It was the, the most I had felt like I belonged to a group of 30 people probably in my life. And that is the best I've probably performed. Is this in your UPT class? Yes, okay. in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, now, to take that environment, and, and also of note, I had a black flight commander. And he gave me feedback like, hey, I saw your interaction here. This needs to be different. Uh, and he gave the same feedback to DL. And he gave that feedback to even our white classmates about certain things. But the, the feedback and the mentorship, I could tell he was exerting the energy to give it, give it well. Uh, and so I really enjoyed my T6 experience. I enjoyed even my T38 experience where I had IPs that were, had no black IPs there, but they were IPs uh, that cared a lot about me, like Keith Carson and Nate Freeman. And they gave me deep feedback uh, down to the letter like you would, like you would want from your mentors. Uh, and I thought that's how the Air Force was everywhere outside of the Air Force Academy. And that was not the case. And I was very surprised uh, when I left UPT. Um, I had a chance to prove that I could do really well there, um, that who you, I so was. So you had a good experience in UPT. I did. I had a great and experience. And you obviously did well. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. I'm assuming uh, yes, sir. to get a Raptor yes, sir. out of that. Yes, sir. Um, and I felt what it felt like, as I said, to, to really belong and be myself. And so I said, okay, that academy experience is behind me. This UPT experience taught me I could be myself and be excellent. I'm going to show up to the, the Raptor basic course and be myself and be excellent, and I should be fine. And I did not find that to be the case. Uh, I had a tough time there. And I asked for feedback at the end of that time there. Were you the only African-American in, the, in this yes. Uh, course? Yes. Uh, and at the end of my time there, I asked for feedback uh, from, from someone senior to me. Uh, and that's when it all kind of, kind of came to a, a bear, if you will, of sitting on the couch looking at him. Uh, and he told me that, uh, that I was the strongest tactical swimmer in the class, but... Uh, the IPs didn't like me. And if I didn't conform, I was going to be weeded out. And he's going to pass this to Langley, my next assignment. And so now I'm facing 10 years of a commitment starting on what just happened. Uh, and now I, I call my mentor who's outside. He's a C-model driver who's out of the Air Force. That's, that's how kind of the gap is. And I, I have to ask him, uh, you know, Wolf, what do I do with this? I have no idea what's just happened to me, and I have no idea how I'm supposed to. Is this an African American mentor? Yes. Okay. Uh, and and what he told me was that this was his story ten years prior. He didn't want to tell me because he didn't want to taint my experience, but that he doesn't have the answer, and then I'm gonna have to figure it out. Uh, and that's how I started my my fighter career. But the feedback is we don't we don't like you, without any. The the list went from. Um, your confidence, I'm not sure where it comes from, and I don't know what to make of it. Uh, maybe you're insecure about something and you're trying to cover it up. So these are, fa- these are fairly tight paraphrases because I, you know, I remember this like it was yesterday. Yep. Um, how are you so comfortable? We don't like that you're chatting up the older IPs in the bar. Uh, these are things that I'm doing because I was told to do them. Yep. I was told to be in the bar and talk to the older IPs. And make Presumably sure the other students are doing the same. Right, and, you're, and you're, it was really confusing to hear this from a fighter pilot from a group who tends to pride itself on being confident and aggressive. And now I'm being told that it's, well, this is what I'm receiving, that it's good to be confident and aggressive, just not for you. 
And it's hard to make ends meet there where some people are allowed to be confident and aggressive and chat, and, but I am not. And so I have to take that experience and figure out what to make of it and how I'm going to survive after that. So the upshot of, uh, uh, what, I don't know, what, what's that called, Raptor Basic or whatever, mm -hmm. was uh, you show up at Langley. Mm -hmm. And uh, does that reputation follow you? It does. It does. Um, and then began a pendulum of me trying to experiment with who I wanted to be on what day, uh, which was, again, this is not, I can't lay this on you know, the men and women at Langley, but this is something minorities have to deal with. I, I have to show up and figure out who I'm going to be. Yeah. Uh, so I show up and I decide to be decidedly quiet. I'm just not going to say anything at all. And then the feedback comes, well, you're too quiet. People think you're too good for this. You should interact more. Uh, and the pendulum just swings either way. Uh, and trying to take feedback and, and do it and, and adjust. And so I spend a significant amount of time trying to figure out which brand of myself is, um, is good to my community uh, when I should be focusing on being lethal. The bottom line is you're, you're trying to be what people or what you're hearing people want you to be as opposed yes. to just being yourself and concentrating on getting your job yes. done. And Airman, uh, one of the, the questions that we had is Airman has said that being black means being two people all the time. What, that kind of speaks to your experience here. Absolutely. Uh, code switching is something you grow up doing, uh, but this was different. This, is, this comes down to even mannerisms. So getting feedback like, you're intimidating when you're in scheduling, when you stand this way, or when you talk this way, or when you sit this way in a brief. Uh, okay, I'll change that, I'll sit this way. Okay, but now you're getting feedback, or I was getting feedback of, okay, you seem too lackadaisical and you're not engaged. Uh, and then getting feedback that you're too aggressive. And then feedback, you know, so bouncing back between the two of these, trying to figure out, well, what is that? Who is this second person that I need to be in order to be uh, accepted here? Yep. Yeah, the uh, the theme that we're hearing of this uh, being uh, having to be two different people all the time. I mean, it it's a it's a cousin, uh, to, I think, to what you're describing, um, uh, because it's a it. But it is a common refer refrain mm -hmm. I've heard from my small group sessions. Uh, I think some of it's related to uh, uh, duty when when you're at when you're on when you're you know on the clock uh, during duty time, and then when you're at home. I think. Uh, but this uh, is uh, why I just say it's related is this is at work, uh, you know, interactions, normal interactions at work. Yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. And I think, sir, that that's, we have to dig into to questions like that. It's important to ask because uh, I ask it of myself. I have to before I reach out even to the rest of my, my uh, African-American, black, Latina, wh whoever, I got to check myself first and figure out, okay, is this, is this good feedback or not? If it is, or if it might be, then just take hold of it and try it, which is why I, I tried to adapt. But when it comes down to it and you, and you start to figure out that nothing is good enough, then you say, okay, when are we crossing the line from, I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to be uh, a professional within this environment and how much of this is, I can't get there from here. Uh, how much of this is, I can't earn the good dude tag from the very basics of my personality and and now is that a problem because um, and I guess the answer to that for me came when all of there's only about 20 black fighter pilots and most of us have had this interaction almost to the exact T of being told this about our personalities and so now I, I mentioned DL Booker DL is a way different man than me and so for, for us to be at different ends of the spectrum personality-wise, but to receive similar feedback, you got to raise some eyebrows uh, at that point. Um, and so once you aggregate that data together, you say, well, if it's, if it's only the black pilots or the females or the LGBTQ+, plus, if it's only this group that is getting this certain feedback, I think we may have an issue. Yeah, so, um, so where the Air Force is zeroing in uh, is unconscious bias. And, uh, and really, you know, so it would, be, uh, it would be easy, I guess, to jump to the conclusion that uh, what you're describing fits uh, neatly in an unconscious bias bucket, uh, and that therefore uh, training, education, uh, f at all levels and at all 
you know, races uh, of airmen in the Air Force uh, isn't sufficient and needs to be bolstered with these types of examples. Do you, do you agree with that, or is, do you think that this is more uh, deliberate? Because if, it's, if, it, because if your answer is it's deliberate, unconscious bias, uh, all the unconscious bias... It's, it's hard to find out who is being deliberate or not. That's a very tough problem to solve. Uh, people aren't burning crosses in the squad and bar. <laughs> right. You know, um, not to make a lot of the situation, <laughs> but obvious situations like that, that's kind of the 21st century, I don't think is going to going to introduce most of that to, to, to us. I think most of this has to be addressed in, on the bias and prejudice front. Um, and it comes down to not only training, but ex- exposure. So, you know, if, you, if there are so few of us that whenever you run across a, a black aviator, you're immediately taken aback by things like physical stature, you know, that might be a, a result of there just not being enough black men around you to where they are now, they're odd. Uh, and they make you feel uncomfortable because it's new. And, and actually, yeah, here's a here's a bit of a of a story that I don't think was malicious, but but gave me insight into what my friends thought. And these are Air Force officers. They went to uh, they went to a, uh, a birthday party in D.C. and they went to a nightclub. And I guess they they didn't figure out what part of town it was on. And they walked in, and it was an all black nightclub. And I, they're telling the story to me. I'm in the room. I'm in the group of people they're telling the story to, and they're, they're saying how they felt like they were going to get stabbed in this black establishment, one that I would go to. And so here my, my, my white colleagues are expressing to me that, oops, I've gone to this all-black place, and I feel in danger, simply because it's, it's all black. And I'm thinking to myself, I walk into an all-white squadron every day. I don't feel like I'm going to get stabbed. Uh, I might be yelled at to make some coffee, uh, but I don't feel in danger in that way. And that, that's the kind of bias we really need to attack. And why, why would people feel that way? Because yeah. uh, that's, that's not acceptable to me. Yeah. Um, kind of in a related vein, uh, since we're there with the off-base uh, example, um, experiences, uh, maybe it's at UPT, maybe it's at a, one of your operational bases, I don't know, uh, with... Um, uh, downtown behavior or how you have to maybe uh, express yourself one way in uniform and it's a completely different experience downtown? Yes. Uh, I've had a number of experiences. Um, uh, you know, go to a, a place uh, and, you know, I always have a military ID on me. That's first, that's first and foremost. I have been stopped and I've had the cops called on me in my own house in multiple bases uh, in my own vehicle, I have been questioned walking somewhere, uh, in fact, in my own apartment complex, uh, and had to decide, you know, am I going to display my, that my pride is hurt right now? Am I going to display being upset because I don't think the way this police officer is treating me is appropriate? Or am I going to, am I really willing to bet my life on this right now? And that's a real thought. Uh, and even so real as, as to say, what happens when my mill idea is gone? Uh, because I know in some situations my mill idea is what maybe saved my life. Mm. Um, and specifically driving back while I was at the Air Force Academy, I-25, uh, it might have been my mill idea and my white friends with me. <laughs> but uh, a cop pulls us over and, uh, and pulls his gun on me until he sees uh, Shay and Andy Herzog in the back. Uh, and then the mill IDs come out and he's like, you know, have a good time, cadets. And that... That's wild to me, and I have to figure out what I'm going to do uh, in those circumstances. Yeah, the, uh, the, some of the survey feedback that the Air Force has already gotten, uh, which, of course, the results are starting to come out to leadership, is uh, communities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this uh, exacerbated uh, uh, racial diversity, uh, or not uh, disparity, I mean, racial disparity situation in our communities. Uh, and, uh, and that is, a, I think, an area that uh, we, as well, uh, need to address. You know, obviously, every ma- uh, major command has community leadership. In fact, I've already had a, uh, an initial, initial salvo uh, with community leadership for AETC uh, on this as one of the areas that, we, hey, we, we simply have to knuckle down. There are, you're probably aware of uh, several uh, that happen. They may even happen uh, in San Antonio. I, the, the instances I know of, uh, are happening in, in some other bases, but they're they're fairly routine, uh, unfortunately, uh, and it's another one that uh, we kind of need to take on. I think. Yes, sir. 
we are we are getting some some questions uh, on the live feed about unconscious bias. Um, Jamal asks, can you define unconscious bias? Is it a way of just providing an excuse for some who are in the category of seeing certain groups as inferior without having to admit they are? If I could use that as an opportunity to ask you a question, yeah. sir, um, because I don't want to, I think it's easy to oversimplify unconscious bias. Yeah. And the question I would ask is, is for you specifically, what, did, what would you have thought racism or bias or prejudice might look like in a professional Air Force military environment? What, what were you looking out for before you said that crosses the line? Um, first, to, let me, I'll, I'll get to that. But uh, to the point of uh, is unconscious bias, how would you phrase it? Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. It's, can you define unconscious bias? Is it a way of providing an excuse for yeah. some who are in the category of seeing, seeing certain groups as inferior without yeah. having to admit they are? Yeah, I, th I think, and I, th I, th I thought you were going to go kind of down this uh, line, Dan. Um, I, I think for some, uh, the label unconscious bias is a convenient excuse. Mm. Uh, I don't think that's it, lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, I think uh, unconscious bias is real. I, I also think that everyone has it. You have it. I have it. Everyone has some to some degree, uh, and so uh, so I, I think it's I think it's kind of both. Uh, I, I think some do use it as an excuse, but I do think that we have it. I I think that uh, our, the training that we have uh, inside uh, our service today is feckless. Mm. Honestly, uh, I've again I've been in the Air Force forty years. I've been through I don't know how you know whatever is required courses that we take and EEO uh, training and uh, et cetera. And uh, it's not something that's in the forefront of my collective thought. Uh, so to your point of, uh, you know, what was I kind of looking out for, um, it's certainly, uh, as I've gotten more senior and in more senior positions where, believe it or not, senior leadership spends a lot of time um, cogitating, thinking about how do we, uh, how do we Im impact the force in a positive direction along these lines that I've really honed. Uh, this, uh, it, w when I was a captain, or if I was, you know, in the uh, in a line unit, um, it certainly, if something was a grossly uh, brought to my attention, it would have to be gross, though. It, it would have some of the things that you've been articulating are very subtle, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, I uh, certainly didn't have antenna tuned uh, to watching for subtleties to make sure that uh, you know I, I come from a crew. Uh, aircraft. Uh, it's uh, two officers, four enlisted crew members. Uh, we had a decent share of, uh, of enlisted uh, crew members that were African American. A handful of uh, pilots, you know, right, which is right. obviously not right. unusual, uh, that were. But uh, but um, it would have had to smack me in the face, honestly. Uh, otherwise, I would have been oblivious to it. Which is frankly uh, why I, you know, admit to you that uh, in some of these instances of airmen. Ex describing to me how it is to take off the uniform and how you get treated downtown or how you're treated uh, by others, African-Americans, when you're in uniform uh, who don't approve of working uh, for the system, right. uh, stuns me because uh, I just hadn't, I, I don't think my antennas are properly uh, tuned. Uh, and I think that that's where uh, this training, whether it's unconscious bias training or whatever, uh, label you want to give it, uh, we have to bolster that. Right, and we've had several uh, comments about that unconscious bias uh, aspect and then um, ways that uh, not just at the Air Force but also the Academy, um, any ideas on how uh, to defeat or work to, against that unconscious bias or make people more aware at least, any ideas there? Um. Yes, sir. Um, my, the way that I think we beat this is we change our approach to it. Uh, the way we talk about diversity, inclusion, what have you, has to shift from uh, it just being a, a nice-to-have effort to improve uh, you know, moral equity, what have you, to, to vital to us accomplishing our mission, which is to defend the country that we love. And so we have to start approaching this thing like we cannot perform and do our job to the best of our ability unless we maximize the diversity in the sense of access every ounce of talent this country has to offer 
for the service of the nation. And if we aren't doing that, we aren't putting the best product forward for our citizenship. Uh, and I think then we aren't being good stewards of our oath at that point. And I think if we do that, we have more commanders digging into this and talking to their people and getting good reflections. And we treat this like we're trying to innovate, like we're trying to come up with a new solution. We're breaking things. We're getting the wrong answers, but we won't stop until we figure it out uh, because that's the model for something that can then be scalable uh, and usable for a country that is diverse and, and prides itself on being able to utilize every single one of the people that crosses its border for the long haul. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure I could say that any better. I'll tell you this. Uh, what's not going to be effective uh, is another PowerPoint uh, <laughs> presentation that, uh, let's just say, EO, EO uh, folks have to give. Mm -hmm. And that's no reflection on EO, but that's not a, properly where it belongs. Uh, I think, you know, General Golfing, if nothing else, uh, will be remembered for the heartbeat of the United States Air Force exists at the squadron, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, and uh, he's a firm believer in that. I am as well. Uh, and that leadership and the, and the squadron commander, the flight commander, the DO, mm -hmm. the first sergeant, the senior enlisted, whoever, that is where you make the difference because you have these discussions. The, the other thing that I uh, would just relay uh, is that uh, this generation of young airmen, um, I don't include myself in this uh, vote, but the young airmen uh, want to share. Uh, witness the small group sessions that I've had, and I've had everything from majors down to you know, one and two stripers. They are not bashful. This generation is not bashful about uh, telling you what's on their mind. And I think we would have good traction. Uh, if it's done in, in a leadership form, small group, I think, is always better because you can, you, know, you obviously have to create a safe space where people feel comfortable to have uncomfortable or tough uh, dialogue. Right. Uh, but that, uh, there's a lot of juice there, mm -hmm. I think, for the squeeze uh, if it's conducted along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and something that we try to do in a classroom, hey, you're going to get this block at SOS, you're going to get this block at ALS or, uh, you know, Senior NCO Academy, that's going to be somewhat effective. It's going to be marginally Absolutely. effective. And I That's think right. at that unit level, you know, the other thing the chief says is, you know, the, the, the leadership of the squadron sets the culture uh, for that squadron. And in turn, it sets the culture for the Air Force. Uh, but if leaders are doing that and setting that culture, hey, we're, we're going to, this is just what we do. We have these kind of difficult dialogues because we're one team. We're all bulldogs or we're all black knights or whatever, you know, whatever we are. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that is, there's juice there. I agree, sir. Yeah. Uh, another question, this one for, for Major Walker. Uh, the question is, for fellow airmen who want to be allies, what can we do to support African-American airmen? Many want to help, but they don't know where to start. Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah. I think the first step is listening, um, and that does two things. One, being welcomed into your office, uh, and then watching, you know, the awkward first 30 seconds to, to feel like, okay, are we being serious here or not? But throwing a couple of our real stories out there and having them be received, uh, that does something for the sender and says, okay, I, someone there is receiving my message. And now I feel comfortable to give you the truth data. And I also feel, I mean, it ends up being a cathartic event of, okay, finally, I get someone who's not just the same person who just experienced it with me because I know that I, I don't want to preach to the choir anymore. I get someone here where I can tell this story to, and they're going to, to believe it. And that is, uh, that's a great feeling. And now for you, you have that information. Uh, and what you do with that information, that's, that's why you have this giant brain on your shoulders, is now you have the data to go do something about it. And if there's one thing I trust young airmen to do is to figure something out. Uh, and when you hear something surprising, it's going to keep you up at night because you know, you're human, and that's what it does to you. And you say, wow, I didn't know. Now I want to work to solve this thing. And I think the answers, as you start to talk to other allies and talk to other minorities, the answers are going to come to you as you continue to work to find them. Uh, so I think talking is the first step. Action-oriented talking, real talking, if you will, no pun intended, uh, yep. will lead to solutions. Yeah. And, and this question is for you, General Webb. Kevin Myers wants to know, what have you been able to learn as a leader during this time that you feel uh, is really imperative for others in leadership positions that they should be learning during this time. Yeah, the uh, 
Well, the experiences uh, of our airmen are, um, are uh, very uh, disparate. Uh, and, uh, and I think, uh, like I said, I grew up in an environment, and obviously I'm uh, of the same generation that our senior leaders are, where we didn't discuss this. Uh, and I don't think uh, your senior leadership is on a journey uh, of a discovery. Uh, because uh, we have, we did not talk like this. Trust me, uh, growing up. So these these kind of ones, you know, these vignettes that I shared with you uh, on young airmen who are uh, berated, uh, you know, for wearing uh, a uniform of the system uh, is just a stunner. Uh, ones that say that feel, hey, um, I mean, the ones that really pull. I, I've told you this before. Your heartstrings is. Uh, does the Constitution, which we swore an oath for, apply to me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is stunning. Uh, and so that, uh, that has really energized within me. Uh, we have got to talk about this. Because if we can't fundamentally find common ground on the U.S. Constitution, and I understand where they're coming from, okay? I'm not saying I don't get it. But it was a stunner to hear that phrase or that that statement. Um, uh, there's a lot of room uh, for us to, as senior leaders, to get oriented, principally because we've never had these kind of conversations before. I agree, sir. And, and to that same point, whenever you look at things like that and you take the data and, and you're active with it, now you say things like, uh, okay, well, let's, let's look at the Constitution. Let me take that history into account, just like the, the white allies you prefer to. I would, I would expect those conversations to lead to some study and to say, okay, what is this person talking about if I'm not familiar? And then, okay, what do I think should be done about that? And if there are still things that are obviously well beyond the, the scope of the Air Force in this conversation, but you know, economic policy, public policy, you name it, if there are things that maybe there are less racist, but the policies they put in place are still there, well then now the ally, the the post-racial, the, the white American that is on your side has to still take what that person did maybe 100 years ago and squash it because it's still standing in the way of the people you care about now, you know, the, the, the things that allow them to eat or be safe at home or otherwise. You know, that may not be your responsibility or your fault, or excuse me, it may not be your fault, but it certainly is our responsibility. We have an, another question. The questions are rolling in. Great. Uh, Alex Carruthers wants to know, with minority officer accessions, promotion, and command selection and rated billets having been a topic of discussion for a long time, do you both see things getting better uh, over the course of your careers, or how do you see that moving forward as an issue? Have I see, if, the, if the question is, have I seen it um, uh, progress over time, uh, the answer is extremely marginally extremely marginally. I mean, if you look at the stats from 1980s uh, to today, you go, it's about the same. Uh, am I uh, optimistic about the future? Yes, I am. Uh, the, this leadership team, uh, you know, I've, I've been privileged to work for General Golfing, uh, you know, our Vice Chief General Wilson, uh, Chief Wright, uh, for f four years now. Uh, and uh, this, the programs that are in place, the, the institutional changes that we're making uh, are not a flip of a switch. It's nothing that we're going to be able to turn on and go, see? Uh, but you have to lay a, a foundation. Uh, and so from uh, for anything from recruiting uh, to, you know, what I, you know, which was the accessions part of the question, but the promotions aspect, the looking for uh, opportunities, uh, that uh, you need to, if you're going to think about hiring an executive officer or an aide de camp, um, kind of a Rooney rule uh, kind of uh, scenario where uh, have you looked at a diverse uh, panoply of candidates or did you go to look for someone who looked just like yourself? Um, you know, the charge from the national security strategy uh, is that we have to be, we're going to have to be agile thinkers. We are not going to be able to take orders and and be automatons and do exactly what the, the boss said, that ain't going to work. Uh, our adversaries that are peer adversaries are going to take that away from us. Uh, and so having uh, the agility of mind to be able to think through difficult problems and come to conclusions that are outside the box demands diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. 
Diversity of thought comes from diversity of backgrounds and diversity of experiences. Uh, it's why that we say, the chief certainly says this, that diversity is a warfighting imperative. Uh, and so um, I think the light switch is coming on. Uh, it's a rheostat. It ain't going to go to bright uh, bulb right away. Uh, but I am optimistic about the future. Uh, but it's a long journey. And in line with that, sir, um, uh, another great question uh, from an AETC perspective about what changes can we expect here in AETC um, on the diversity, diversity and inclusion front? Well, uh, diversity and inclusion has been part of AETC's uh, priorities uh, from really day one. Uh, when I, when I, uh, day one for me anyway, when I got in here, uh, you know, we kind of articulated what, uh, uh, what the charge was from the chief. Uh, you know, he gave me a letter with some guidance, uh, one of which was diversity as a warfighting uh, imperative. Uh, but, um, but there are any number of issues from rated diversity initiative to uh, diversity in the cyber realm, diversity in the Space Force uh, that we're after. Uh, in light of what's happened here in the last uh, two months, uh, we have a task force stood up in AETC. It has connective tissue to the air staff uh, uh, task forces that I've you know, previously discussed. It also has connectivity down and into the NAF uh, and to the wing level uh, task forces. Uh, I think what you're going to see is, and we're going to be in, we're in phase one for sure right now, which is seeking to understand, and that is listening. You, you, you said it earlier. Uh, uh, we need to listen. We need to kind of, what the chief says, squint with our ears. Don't talk so much and listen. But at some point that has to translate to action. Uh, and so some of these uh, examples that I you know, articulated earlier about uh, name tapes and, and uh, accommodations for, um, for you know, hairstyles and grooming accommodations, stuff like that, uh, they're, they're a start, uh, but they... But, uh, I expect uh, from an AETC perspective that there will be a much more substance in there, and it needs to be brought to the forefront. In other words, it needs to be part of the everyday conversation at the unit level uh, about um, uh, real belonging. I think that's the right word, belonging. Uh, I've heard you say it before. Mm -hmm. I didn't really feel like I belonged. Yes, I was part of the unit. Yes, I flew with them. Yes, I did my job. Was I really, did I really feel belonging? Yes, sir. That, uh, to me, as your commander, breaks my heart. Uh, and it's what, frankly, it's probably what, you know, you said, you know, what keeps you up at night. Those are the kind of things that keep me up at night. I've got serving members that go, I feel like I'm kind of a tenant. Or I'm not a tenant, but, a, uh, but a, um, I'm renting. And, uh, and that, I, I want to instill that in every one of our leaders to go, uh-uh, that's not acceptable in this, in this command. Jamil wants to know, how do we as a service correct the issue of inconsistent or convenient policy enforcement? Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of the, uh, look, it exists. I, 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 would, I would not uh, uh, try to state uh, otherwise, uh, but uh, this, is where, uh, the con this is where our education has fallen short. Uh, and I think we're relying too much on uh, formal classwork uh, for our education where it needs to be uh, uh, you know, powered down uh, to the unit level. Uh, I, I mean, I think I, I do think that's fundamentally what, where it's going to change. I, I don't think uh, from uh, uh, if, if you can instill the intent of the policy from higher up down at that unit level, that I mean, the unit takes on the uh, personality of the commander. I fundamentally believe that, uh, and if it's happening there, it'll happen. Uh, dictating it from on high and expecting the policy to be consistent uh, is uh, you're, you're not going to probably uh, uh, reach success. <laughs> I mean, I just, that's the way I see it. And Major Walker, um, a question was out there um, about you know, the younger generation and maybe not having role models uh, per se to look up to. You mentioned the number of black cadets in your class at the academy, and then, the, again, the number of black pilots uh, in your community. Um, so what can be done in your mind from a mentorship perspective um, when it comes to the next generation that's, that's coming in and maybe don't even think of the Air Force or the military itself as an option? Great question. Um, and I think this goes to your point earlier about seeking solutions and, and it coming down to the unit level. Um, 
so a quick story about that. I was a, I was a recruiter at the academy for a year before I went to pilot training. And uh, I asked a, an ALO to set me up with a recruiting tour in Southern California. He said, yes, I got you. I'm like, hey, I'm from the, the diversity recruiting section of admissions. So do with that what you would. I've got some diverse schools from you. And as you can imagine, I was sent directly to Beverly Hills where it was not diverse <laughs> at all. And so now it's on me as the individual uh, to go on my own excursion, which I did. I drove to South Central LA and I'm, and I'm like, this is where I'm going to find talent because it's, it's here. There are human beings here, so there's going to be a top 10% of these people that are capable of coming to my academy and executing this program and doing great things. And to walk into a school like that and have them look at me because I'm probably the first one to walk into that place and say, one of you here can do this, was astonishing. Yeah. Uh, and that changed my life forever mm. because we have to go find it. Because uh, right now, the Air Force is kind of set in the policies from old and say this is about where we get our talent from. Right. And all our talent kind of looks the same, so that it would be an indicator of where we're pulling it from. But once we start searching in the rough, if you will, because there's talent there that can go and find solutions, I think we're going to find talent. Yeah. Um, spot on. Uh, so another question, um, this one for uh, General Webb. Did the Protect Our Defenders report ever cause you to reflect on how you – administer military justice as a commander? Yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, my first reaction to the Pre Protect Our Defenders report was, I'm not sure I uh, believe that data. I'm, just, I'm being real with you. Uh, and I uh, dug into it uh, a bit. Um, you know, I, I'm in my second MAGCOM, and my experience, uh, if you look at those stats, because of course I went immediately to the last couple years where I been, was the AFSOC commander, and you can see uh, the disparity. And, uh, you know, we had an instance, for, uh, for example, of um, a drug bust that happened at one of my bases. Uh, it, was a, it was principally a ring of young African-American males, first term young African-American males. And I go, that probably accounts for, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying young African-American males all do drugs, but when they do, they get busted out of the system. But as you looked more at that, it, it, was, uh, it did not explain uh, all that uh, disparity. And so it, was, um, uh, it took a little bit of uh, taking the blinders off from my perspective. To, you know, frankly, I'd never heard of that report uh, before two months ago. Um, and presumably that has existed uh, in, you know, for some time uh, within our Air Force, I would just assume. Uh, and, so, um, and it took probably the chief saying, we're not going to argue this. We're going to own it. Uh, like I said earlier, and we're going to move out in this. We're going to own it, own, you know, owning it. We all understand what that means. Uh, we have to take hold of this, uh, accept it, uh, and do positive action towards it. And the more you dig at uh, the statistics, the more you recognize that um, uh, it, it does, uh, it is there. Uh, you, you can, I think uh, there is room, room for discussion on whether that's happening at the first-line supervisor level, mm -hmm. and inside the squadron level. Uh, I don't think you see it so much at the, at the headquarters level because, frankly, by the time a case gets to the MATCHCOM commander, right. it's a done deal. Right. Uh, there, there's been a caseload of uh, Article 15s or, you know, whatever uh, to that point where, you know, it's obvious what you need to do. Right. But down here, what was happening was, was an African-American male being given a letter of reprimand for being late to work uh, when the white counterpart got verbally counseled. This is what we have to dig at. Right. Right. Uh, because you went, you know, if you start building the case, then of course it's an obvious when it reaches a, at a very senior level. Uh, but this is where I think there's room uh, for us to really examine our unconscious bias. Maybe uh, if I'm being, uh, uh, you know, if I'm gifting that that's you know what the situation was, and, and really look. This is where we need to really drill in and, and understand what's happening here, and this is where we can make a difference. We've got a last couple of questions here. Um, I'll ask this first one, um, and we'll start with Major Walker. What would you tell anyone who's interested in being in the Air Force and being a pilot, but they're worried about racial injustice, not only in our country, but in, in the Air Force? What, what advice would you give them? Uh, I, that's a great question, because I know that I, I received advice. Uh, that was scary advice when I was coming out of the academy, which was basically don't do it. You're going to have a bad time. 
and then they're going to wash you out and you're going to go to finance. So you might as well just cut the middleman out and get ready to get out at your four years and, and do your thing uh, because that was the overwhelming experience of cadets that had, that had left and gone to pilot training. And so my advice from where I sit is to do it if you want to do it. Uh, if you want to go and fly airplanes fl fast and do some cool stuff and see some cool things, do it. Understand that this conversation is rooted in the fact that there are going to be some challenges along the way, uh, but now you have men and women working on these challenges, and they may not be solved by the time you get where you're going. So you can take my stories and, and say, okay, yes, I've seen this before, and then you can call me or the others of us in your position to help you through it. Uh, but I would not let anything that's being said here that's happened to me or otherwise deter you from going and doing some awesome stuff with your life. Uh, not to mention all the benefits that, you know, coming out of the Air Force Academy, going in the you know, all these kind of things. I mean, if you want to talk about an opportunity to go for some upward mobility, uh, this is definitely it if you can play it right with the right mentorship. So uh, get in and then get help if you need it. I think your point about uh, mentorship, uh, both from uh, those that, you know, happen to be from your underrepresented group, mm -hmm. but also uh, whites, uh, if you know, if and where appropriate. That, I think that's helpful. Uh, you know, I really, that, I really resonate with that. It takes, uh, uh, it takes a kind of a disparate uh, mentorship uh, portfolio, Absolutely. if you will. And lastly, uh, on this note, um, are you encouraged by the steps being taken by the DOD uh, and the Air Force in terms of, uh, of addressing racism in the ranks? Uh, so if you don't mind, I actually, I have a couple of quotes I want to read off. Um, first one is, uh, my fighter experience was the most demoralizing experience in my life, and I've been homeless. Uh, second is, to be yourself and thrive in a fighter squadron as a black man is an oxymoron, either conform or fail. And the third one is, uh, I've hated being a fighter pilot more days than I've liked it. You couldn't pay me enough money to do it again. These are my friends. These are my brothers. Uh, and my sisters, actually. Uh, but in our conversations currently, uh, we're all fairly shocked at the response that we're seeing, both outside the Air Force and in it, of, wait a minute, people are actually listening to us. We're here on a fairly ad hoc Facebook Live telling stories that I, we're pretty sure we were just going to have to write books about once we got out. Um, this is the start of something different, and when you ask about optimism, it's, it's certainly in the room. We're holding out for, is this going to keep up? Like you said, when the hurricanes hit and the virus gets bad, you name it, there are plenty of other off-ramps for not doing anything. And these men and women are going to leave and go elsewhere if they see that happen. But these same sentiments are laced with optimism now that if the energy continues, things may get better and they may be able to continue on with the thing they've wanted to do since they were children, which is important to them and it's, it should be important to us. Hmm. Great. Um, so I want to share one last story as we kind of uh, conclude uh, this. Um, I was uh, uh, privy to the discussion that uh, Chief Wright shares uh, about, um, uh, hey, you know, if there's a house on fire on a street somewhere, have you heard this story? And uh, the firemen, of course, respond. Uh, and what the firemen don't do is go down the street and put water on every house. Uh, they ought to go to the house that's on fire. Uh, and, uh, and the case in point uh, that I would, you know, we've, we've covered a lot of ground here on uh, race relations and racial disparity. The house that's on fire in the Air Force is this young African-American male first-term justice disparity. Uh, now, I'm not saying these other houses aren't important. Of course they're important. Uh, but we, as an Air Force, ought to take, we got to eat this elephant one bite at a time. Whatever metaphor you want to use, uh, it'll overwhelm us uh, if we try to take on everything in a 360-degree you know, pattern. Uh, but if we drill down uh, on this uh, that was put you know, blatantly in front of the leadership's face from the Protect Our Defenders report and take this on, I contend that it'll open the other doors, and we can service the rest of those houses down the street and keep them safe. But that's the house that's on fire uh, in the Air Force. It's, it, it lock, stock, and barrel, but that's it. 
Um, folks, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in. Thank you uh, as well for uh, work, uh, staying with us through our uh, uh, difficulties uh, with the Internet. Uh, if you stayed this long, I'm very appreciative. Um, I think, you know, my message is the same one that I delivered in the beginning. Uh, this is a moment. Uh, this is our moment. Um, and we ought to seize it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we really have uh, the opportunity to really make good history. Uh, and I would implore each and one of, every one of us to continue this dialogue. Together we can make really good. Think about if they talk about this moment like we talk about uh, the Civil Rights Act in the 60s and what changes that brought. It didn't make everything perfect, but it definitely advanced the ball. We have the, ch we have the opportunity to do that now. Dan, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a, a very difficult ask of me to come here uh, and ask you to be on camera and to, and to share stuff that's uh, very personal. Um, I, I tell you what, it made a mark on me. I hope it's made some marks on others, but thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody. Me,